Okay, so we will start our revision for today. Okay, so those who will join later, I will actually allow uh, to join later. So for now, it's going to be, this is going to be a revision, okay, for our, what we have learned until now. So if you look at it, okay, uh, the first thing that we have learned is going to be the methods of collecting gases. Of course, we started off, Okay, with uh, experimental techniques and what are the devices, uh, what are the apparatus that we use in the lab and so on. Like, for example, you need to know when to use burette, how to use pipette and so on. Yeah, but I will start the revision okay, with the methods of collecting gases. So there are three methods of collecting gases, yeah, which is going to be the first method is going to be displacement. Second method is a downward delivery. Third method is going to be upward delivery. Now for displacement reaction, okay, we actually use is uh, basically is going to be displacement of water. Okay, so we actually use okay in order to displace the water, we have to use insoluble gases. So the gases, if let's say there are certain gases that you can collect using displacement method, which are going to be carbon dioxide gas, okay, hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. So these are insoluble gases or maybe uh, slightly soluble with uh, water, yeah, carbon dioxide, hydrogen and oxygen. Now, when we use uh, downward delivery and upward delivery, okay, these two uh, methods of collecting gases, we use them for soluble gases. What are soluble gases? Chlorine gas, hydrochloric acid, ammonia, they are all soluble. Now, I want you to remember, okay, the one that is going to be denser or kind of heavy, whenever that you see uh, Cl, okay, let it be in chlorine gas or HCl, always remember Cl is heavy. Why? Cl is 35 or uh, if you look at the periodic table, it's quite big, yeah, it's quite big. So generally, whenever you have Cl, okay, Cl are going to be heavy gases. So I want you to remember, okay, chlorine gas, hydrochloric gas, they are heavy. So they are high density. So it means if it is high density compared to air, they will go down. So we have to use downward delivery. Now for upwards delivery, we always use for soluble gases. Why soluble gases? Because soluble gases, we cannot use displacement method. And this gas must be less dense. Example, ammonia. Ammonia is going to be less dense they will go up yeah because nitrogen if you look at the periodic table is 14 okay 14 plus 3 so 17 is quite uh not so heavy yeah so it is less dense so they are less dense than uh, air they will go up now i just want to show you the picture yeah the diagram okay so the first diagram that we have over here is going to be the water displacement technique Okay, where the gas will come over here. Okay, these are all water. Okay, so they are going to bubble and then the gas will start to displace. Okay, the, uh, they will start to displace the water and the gas will be collected over here. So Dave, can you tell me what are the gases, the three examples of gases that you can collect over here, Dave? Uh, CO2, H2O2. Yes, okay. These are the three gases insoluble in uh, water or slightly soluble in water. We can collect them. Now, if you look at this uh, second diagram, okay, Gianna, you're also there. Gianna, can you tell me, okay, the second diagram, is it upward delivery or downwards delivery? If let's say the gas is coming over here. Upwards. Yeah, it is upwards. Now, when it, uh, it is outwards, okay, upwards. So, Dave, this is for collecting uh, dense gases or less dense gases. Which one goes up? Dense or did less you, dense? Did you call me? Did you call me? Yes, yes, Dave. Uh, that's for less dense. Okay, so these are for less dense. And I told you the one that is going to be having Cl will be more heavier, that is will be more dense. So this one is going to be uh, uh, ammonia, okay? Ammonia will be best uh, suitable to be collected this way. 
Now, for uh, downwards delivery, I'm going to select this and I'm just going to copy and paste. Okay. So the downwards delivery is going to be quite simple, but it's just, uh, you just need to flip it. Yeah. So you, it is going to be something like this. Okay. The gas will come and then the gas will go down and this is going to be for uh, high density gases. Okay. Compared to air. The example of those gases are going to be the one that contains CL, so chlorine gas and also HCl. And both of these gases, we cannot collect them using water displacement method, okay, because okay, they are soluble in water. So therefore, okay, there you have it. You have, okay, number one is going to be uh, water displacement method. Number two is going to be upwards delivery. Number three is going to be downwards delivery. So done with the collecting of gases. Yeah. So the let uh, the next one is going to be once you collect this gas, normally we need to dry them. Yeah. So we want to dry the gases. So you can use three uh um, three chemicals. Okay, to dry the gases. The first chemical is going to be concentrated sulfuric acid. Yeah. So this is sulfuric acid. So I will write down over here sulfuric acid okay now this concentrated sulfuric acid you can use for to dry all types of gases except for ammonia yeah except for ammonia and we also have okay fused calcium chloride okay this is calcium chloride now you can also use fused calcium chloride okay but in the textbook they didn't mention this i want you to take note Okay, it is also going to be used to collect all the gases except for ammonia. So these two methods okay, of using concent concentrated sulfuric acid and fused calcium chloride, we are going to use for all gases except for ammonia. Now, what is the reason why? Okay, why ammonia cannot? Yeah, why we co cannot uh, dry ammonia? Okay, do you know the reason, Dave? Uh, no, yeah, uh, it's okay. Yeah, ammonium. Okay, we want to dry them. Okay, but acid. Okay, acid is going to react with ammonia because ammonia is a base. Okay, so there will be a reaction. So the reason we when we want to dry the gases, we want to remove the water, but we do not want it to react with the gas. So what concentrated sulfuric acid and calcium chloride will do, they will react with ammonia. So we do not want the reaction with ammonia. So the reason why we don't use that because okay, both will react. Okay, both will react with ammonia. We don't want that. Okay, so we do not want that. Okay, uh, to happen. Okay, that is the reason why we don't use concentrated sulfuric acid and fused calcium chloride. Instead for ammonia. Okay, we instead for ammonia, what we use. Okay, we can use quick lime. Okay, quick lime is going to be calcium oxide. Okay, calcium oxide CaO okay, is used to dry ammonia. So you can okay, dry ammonia using quick lime. Yeah, so therefore, okay, in summary, if you look at drying of gases, there are three chemicals. Okay, you can use concentrated sulfuric acid, you can use calcium, fused calcium chloride. Okay, but for ammonia, okay, we will use the quick lime, okay, calcium oxide, okay, because calcium oxide do not react with ammonia, okay, that's quite simple, yeah, that is going to be under drying of gases. The next part, we are going to actually go into solutions and solubility. Now, in this chapter, okay, we have learned what is a uh, solute, yeah, and what is solvent, and what is solution? Yeah, solute normally, okay, we are going to have solid particle, okay, that will dissolve, okay, in solvent. Okay, so what is the meaning of solvent? Solvent is something that would dissolve solute, okay. And when you have solute and when you have solvent, you are going to get solution. Example, yeah, if you have, um, if you have salt, okay, and I have water, and you are going to get salt water okay so we can say the salt which is going to be the solute water is the solvent okay and salt water is a solution now there are three questions over here yeah let's see whether you guys can answer this or not yeah for this chapter you need to 
answer should be able to answer these three questions. So what is aqueous solutions? Dave, can you try to answer this? What uh, is solution aqueous? Where, uh, mm. uh, cannot, uh, where cannot uh, dissolve anymore. No, that is soft. that is saturated solution, Dave. Yeah. So aqueous solution, okay, whenever we write like for example. Yes, okay, correct. If I have HCl and I write aqueous, it means that HCl gas I have already dissolved in water, okay, and then I am going to get hydrochloric acid. So HCl aqueous means okay, the solvent is water. So anything that dissolves in water is going to be called as aqueous solution. So you can just say a solution, okay, where the solvent is going to be water, okay? And water uh, is often referred as a uh, universal solvent. Why? Because water can dissolve many things. A lot of solutes can dissolve in water. Now, the next question is going to be, what is the relationship between solubility and temperature? Now, this is quite simple, okay? Solubility, okay, something can be soluble more when the temperature increases. So, like for example, if you want to make hot coffee, okay, uh, you want to make coffee, of course, you mix with hot water. Why? Because the coffee and the sugar can dissolve better, okay, in water at high temperature. So, temperature high, Okay, solubility is also going to be high. Yeah, so solubility increases when temperature increases. And the last one is like what Dave have mentioned just now. Okay, what is saturated solution? The solution where the solute okay, cannot dissolve okay, or cannot, uh, cannot uh, dissolve okay, in solvent anymore. So it means that uh, it is already like too saturated. A lot of solvent, uh, a lot of solute is inside the solvent until there is uh, the solute cannot dissolve anymore. Okay, so that is saturated solution. Okay, like for example, you make a uh, coffee and you add uh, add sugar. Okay, but you cannot keep on adding sugar because uh, there will be a moment where the sugar will actually start to uh, sediment. Yeah, it will actually go. Uh, and uh, go down okay, to the bottom of the cup okay, because they cannot dissolve anymore. But there is a way to make it dissolve some more because you know that temperature increase, solubility increases. What you can do, okay, even though you have a saturated solution, you can heat it up okay, and then maybe okay, the solubility increases. Okay, you can have uh, the, the sugar that actually went down okay, uh, can react some more. Yeah? Okay, but that is going to be what we learn under saturated solution. This saturated solution, we will learn more, okay, later when I discuss about crystallization, okay, we will uh, look into this um, saturated solution again, okay. Therefore, now, okay, we are going into these methods of uh, separation. Now, when it comes to methods of separation, yeah, I just want to also uh introduce or write down or mention about this one uh method of separation which is going to be decantation decantation is very very simple okay but i think uh a lot of students because we didn't learn they do not know yeah but decantation is going to be basically if you have okay let's say if you have sand and water okay this is going to be decantation Okay, if let's say you leave it after a while, okay, the sand will go at the bottom and then water will be at the top. Okay, and we can remove the water a little bit, yeah, because sand is at the bottom. So we carefully remove it, okay, and then we try to separate the water from the sand. So this is going to be what we call as decantation method. So basically, you separate them, you leave it overnight, okay? You have two, let's say, sand at the bottom, water at the top. You remove it, yeah, manually, yeah? You pour it, okay? So that is going to be called decantation, yeah? And we have learned the second one is going to be filtration, okay? You can see the diagram for the filtration over here. So this is filtration, okay? So filtration, what we do, Okay, we uh, try to use the filter paper. We uh, fold the filter paper, okay, and then we uh, we will actually put, uh, put it in the funnel over here. 
and then we are going to uh, separate okay let's say any kind of solution even uh, sand and water yeah you want to separate okay you can use the filtration method so what is important over here is to know what is at the top and what is at the bottom let's say i am going to put sand water over here okay so uh, gianna if i put sand water over here what do you think that will get stuck at the top and what will be at the bottom gianna Jenna, are you there? Okay, maybe Jenna is having internet connection. Yeah, 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 Jenna. You're muted. Okay, maybe Jenna can. Uh, what was the question? Sorry. Okay, my question is maybe it's too uh, noisy. It's okay. Jana, my question is, if I put sand water, yeah, what will be at the top? What will be at the bottom? Yeah, so maybe Dave, can you help me to answer this? Let's actually move on fast. Okay, what will be at the top? Okay, at the top, there will be sand. Okay, at the bottom, there will be water. Now, I want to know what is the name that is given. Okay, I have written over here. It can be either residue or filtrate. So can you tell me which one is residue? Which one is the filtrate? Uh, residue is sand and filtrate is water. Yes. Okay. The residue is at the top. Okay. And then the filtrate is going to be the water. Very good. Yeah. So this one is important. Okay. So done with the filtration part. Yeah. So let's go for the third one, which is going to be crystallization. Yeah. Crystallization is normally used to separate, like for example, uh, examples would be, let's say, uh, if I have copper sulfate, yeah, copper sulfate solution. Co uh, there are certain uh, chemicals in our lab, yeah, where they can actually form crystals. Okay, this one, the equation, no need to worry. Okay, but okay, when they form crystals, okay, they uh, they can be separated. Like for example, if I have a solution, this copper sulfate solution, they are actually blue in color. Okay, so when this blue solution, yeah, when I uh, try to uh, separate between copper sulfate and alone, yeah, so what I can do over here is, okay, I can try to uh, separate using, okay, let's say for example, I can um, do crystallization method, okay, so what I can do is, okay, I can uh, heat it up. Okay, and you can see this method. Okay, I can heat it up. Okay, and try to make the solution as saturated as possible. Just now I told you, we will look into saturated again. Yeah, so how to make sure it is really, really saturated. Okay, this is going to be a glass rod. Okay, and if you heat up, if you see some kind of formation of this, uh, some kind of um, uh, coating. Yeah, there is a coating like some kind of a, a colorless coating or something like that, okay? Uh, when you put the glass rod and take it out, okay? And if you see something is being formed on top of the glass rod over there, that is the time that we say this solution has been saturated because we have heated with uh, enough, um, enough, uh, we have heated, yeah? But cannot heat uh, too strongly, yeah? So the aim is to get it saturated and do not heat up until all the water goes off. Yeah, we just heat up until it becomes saturated, and then okay, we will uh, we will actually allow them. Okay, no need to put into filter paper immediately. Okay, we will allow them to cool down. Okay, and the the duration is up to you. Yeah, we can actually allow to cool down for maybe one hour. Okay, better one day. Okay, so if you allow them to cool down, the next day. Okay, the crystal will be formed. So what we can do, we can put the crystal okay, into the filter paper, let it dry okay, because it might still contain uh, some of the water and so on. And then you can actually see the crystal being collected over there on top of the filter paper. You dry it and then you will have the crystal. Yeah. So this is how we do crystalli uh, crystallization method of separation. Yeah. So any question? Can uh, can you understand this, Dave? So far, so good. Yes. Okay. 
Now, so the fourth one is going to be simple distillation. Okay, for the simple distillation, okay, you can see the diagram over here. I will actually go through simple distillation and fractional distillation together. Okay, basically simple distillation and fractional distillation, uh, we are going to separate them based on difference in boiling point. Yeah, so like for example, if you have a uh, seawater, for example, yeah, so if you want to separate seawater, we can actually use uh, salt water. Yeah, we can actually use simple distillation also. Yeah, so what will happen? Water, okay, it will boil, okay, they will go up, okay, and then this is what we call as condenser, okay. This condenser, okay, generally contains a water jacket where the water will go in, okay. This is the cool water will go in and then the hot water will come out. Why? Because they will go against the gravity, it will take time. So this is still hot, okay, the vapor or the gas, okay, the vapor, okay, they will condense, okay, because of the uh, lower temperature that is being provided by the water over here, yeah. So they will condense and then when they go up, there will be hot water coming out, they will remove the heat, yeah, they will remove the heat. So what will happen? All these gas will slowly condense and then they will change into liquid, they will drop, okay, and then you will collect them as distillate, okay. So the distillate, the one that will be collected is the one that has the boiling point which is lower lower boiling point okay will be changed into gas first so therefore okay the one that has lower boiling point will be collected first okay so uh, for fractional mm, uh, mm. the boiling point difference has to be less right yes correct okay so this is going to be the fractional distillation so uh whenever the boiling point difference is uh very close to each other okay for example if you have water and alcohol water boiling point is 100 degrees celsius ethanol is 70 degrees celsius they are close uh, to each other so if i simply uh, boil what will happen both of the alcohol and the water they will end up being collected if you use simple uh, uh, distillation so what we can do okay we can use the fractional distillation okay what the fractional distillation will do okay they have the fractionating column where they will have these glass bits over there and they are going to make uh, the the heavier heavier molecule okay to drop down generally the uh, the smaller molecules they can uh, can actually go up and then the boiling point is also lower okay so the smaller molecules they will go up in this case let's say we have water and then we have alcohol i'll just put uh, this alcohol so the smaller water they will actually squeeze in they will move and then change into gas then they will come over here okay but okay the bigger molecule which is going to be the alcohol they will move and then they lose their energy immediately from gas they change into liquid they come and fall down again okay they try to move up and then slow down by the glass bit then they will change and drop back okay so this is going to be the function of the fractionating column they will only allow okay the boy uh, the substance with lower boiling point okay to go up first okay and it is very crucial for substances that are going to be having the difference of boiling point which is very going to be very close to each other yeah and then the function the rest of the function is still the same okay the water will go in over here water will go out over here Okay, and it will take time to uh, cool, yeah, so it cannot be the other way around, yeah. So we do not put the water in from the top because it will flow with the gravity. And if they flow with the gravity, they will immediately go out, okay. So uh, the cooling will not be that efficient, yeah. We still want an efficient cooling by increasing the time of cooling. So if you go uh, up yeah, against the gravity, the time of cooling will be more so the cooling will be more efficient yeah so you will still uh, get over here so if let's say if you are using uh, alcohol and water okay the one with lower boiling point okay uh, they will be collected over here which is going to be just now i was wrong yeah this one the water is going to drop so the ethanol yeah will be collected though so, so this one will be c2h5 will be collected okay the lower boiling point will be collected the one that will drop is water okay so the alcohol will go up okay and then this is going to be the alcohol
okay gas and then they will change into water uh the liquid yeah so they will condense and they drop okay so always remember the lower boiling point will be collected first okay that is very very important okay and the last one is going to be paper chromatography okay so i will uh, show you the paper chromatography so basically the important thing about paper chromatography is okay you have the baseline the baseline must be re uh, drawn using pencil line yeah if you use pen okay they have pigment and the pigment will also move together okay uh, during the separation we don't want that yeah so the solvent can be uh, alcohol and so on okay uh, so the important thing is the solvent okay should not be higher than the baseline yeah so it must be lower than the baseline or the pencil line and then we put okay we put it straight and the uh this solvent will move up they will actually carry and separate the uh the mixture that you have okay and at the top when they stop okay this is what are going to be the, what we call a solvent front so when we calculate okay we will calculate from the baseline let's say for example this is going to be the pigment that is separated we are going to find the rf value the, the retention factor yeah the retention factor you have to calculate you have to measure okay from the baseline to here that is going to be x divided by okay from here to here up to solvent front not up to the top of the filter paper yeah up to the solvent front okay if they didn't give the value of the solvent front you can assume up to the top but if they say there is up to this uh line yeah then you follow that line so x divided by y yeah so most of the cases if let's say the pigments are colored we can see the color easier to identify but sometimes if you want to do separation okay using paper chromatography but you cannot see uh, sometimes like separation protein you cannot see so we have to use uh, what we call as locating agent yeah so it's extra knowledge also what is locating agent locating agent is like a chemical that we spray yeah we spray on top okay so that when we spray on top it will give you a color okay so when they give you a color we can see and we can identify so what is locating agent locating agent is going to be a chemical okay that will help us to identify the pigments that are going to be separated yeah so especially for those pigments that uh, are colorless cannot be seen yeah just like that so we use the locating agent this is very important yeah locating agent now the next part that i want to teach you is going to be diffusion number five okay which is going to be what is diffusion diffusion basically movement from high concentrated okay uh too low concentrated okay so uh diffusion is going to be okay diffusion can happen for solid liquid and gas always remember that but it will be faster when it comes to gas because there's a lot of space between them yeah so it will be also do remember when it comes to gas okay uh they are faster for smaller molecules okay or small mr okay so what is MR relative molecular mass? Yeah. So you can calculate using the periodic table. Okay, the mass from the mass number from the periodic table. Example. Okay, if you have um cotton, uh, if you have a cotton and then you go and uh have ammonia. Okay, and then you have hydrochloric acid over here, and then you allow them to be in a closed tube. Okay. And you want to see the reaction. So basically, what will be the reaction? The reaction is ammonia react with hydrochloric gas they will give you ammonium chloride this ammonium chloride okay when we see in this experiment they will form some sort of a white ring yeah you can see a white ring okay being formed so my question over here is uh, the question that they always ask is where is the position of the white ring will it be at the middle which is going to be position number two or will it be closer to ammonia or will it be closer to hcl to answer this okay you need to know the mass okay so nitrogen from the periodic table is 14 hydrogen is one you calculate you get 17 hcl okay h is one okay cl from the periodic table the mass is 35 you get one plus 35 36 so basically this will tell us which one is bigger which one smaller yeah so dave which one is going to be bigger over here 
what do you mean by bigger? Oh, I know it's ammonia is going to go further. Yeah, so bigger means the heavier, yeah? So the heav heavier it is, they are not going to travel further, yeah? So you know the ammonia will go further. Don't memorize, yeah? So ammonia is light, okay? It is uh, not that heavy, okay? So it's smaller, okay? So uh, they are going to travel further, okay? They are going to travel further. Therefore, okay, the white ring will appear somewhere at position number three because the diffusion for ammonia is more, okay? And then compared to HCl, okay? So the reason you need to show based on this, yeah? So you need to know why, okay, they travel further, yeah? At which position? The position is going to be position number three. Why? Because ammonia is a smaller molecule compared to hydrochloric acid. How do you know smaller or bigger? Okay, by calculating the mass. Okay, this is very important. The mass can be calculated from the mass number in your periodic table. So nitrogen 7, 14, you take the bigger one. Yeah. So Cl, 17, 35, you take Cl. Yeah. So hydrogen is H11, you take this one. Yeah. So 14 plus 3 times 1, so it's going to be 17. This one is going to be 1 plus 35, you get 36. Simple as that, yeah? So the next part that I want to go is going to be the particulate nature of um, uh, matter, okay? We need to know that solid can change into liquid, liquid can change into gas, gas can change into liquid, liquid can change into solid. So solid can change into liquid by melting process, okay? Liquid can change into gas, okay, using boiling process. And another one is evaporation process. It can be uh, both process. Okay, gas can change into liquid, okay, which is going to be what process, Dave? Condensation. Yes, condensation. And then liquid can change into solid by freezing, yeah. So this is quite simple, okay? But I'm just going to ask you, okay, what is sublimation? Okay, so uh, Dave, do you know what is sublimation? Uh, solid to gas and gas to solid. Okay, so the example that I have over here, I'm just going to use uh, solid to gas immediately. So what is sub sublimation? Basically, solid change into gas without passing through liquid, yeah? or gas change into solid without passing through the liquid. But the example, okay, is going to be dry ice and iodine. So both of these examples are solid to gases, yeah? Dry ice immediately is solid, it will change into gas, okay? Dry ice is going to be uh, solid carbon dioxide, yeah? So, and then uh, iodine, okay? Iodine is going to be black solid, okay? Black solid, Okay, then when they change into gas, they are going to become purple gas. Okay, so maybe you can uh, take note of that. Yeah, so this is sublimation. So the next part is going to be what is the difference between evaporation and boiling? Yeah, we know both of these reaction, uh, both of these process are going to be uh, from liquid to become gas. Okay, but the difference is boiling happens at boiling point only. Okay but evaporation happens at any temperature okay very important and evaporation happens at the surface okay at the surface but boiling happens all throughout okay so basically evaporation at the surface only yeah not at uh, the entire solution yeah so that's the difference between evaporation and boiling, yeah? So the difference are there. Now, here, below here, I have actually two graphs, okay? One of one of it is going to be heat, heat graph, heating curve, and another one is cooling curve, okay? Dave, can you tell me which one is going to be heating curve, left uh, or right? Heating curve is the first one. Yes, okay? Heating curve, you can see it is going up, yeah? And then cooling curve is actually going down. So very important, okay, um, when you look at it, okay, it will start from solid. So do remember, this is solid, okay, when you heat up, okay, solid, okay, they will start to vibrate, okay, and slowly, okay, at this point, okay, they start to actually change, 
okay start to change do not completely change yeah so this is what we call as melting point okay so melting point is going to happen at this uh, part yeah so the temperature that is going to be constant that's going to be melting point so at this melting point the state is going to be very interesting it is going to be between solid and liquid okay the state will be between these two yeah but the moment they reach over here okay they are completely liquid okay they are completely liquid and at this time okay at this point this is going to be what we call as boiling point okay boiling point and this is part the state is going to be between liquid they are still uh, changing yeah so liquid and gas together okay the one that is going to be a uh, straight line over there and then the one that go, goes up they have already changed into gas okay please take note of that okay so similar to that okay so if you have a cooling uh, curve over here of course they will start with gas okay so we know that this one is going to be um so before okay um you will have the melting point and boiling point okay you can see if you start from here okay so solid so this one is going to be the melting point i'll just put down here melting point and the one on top is going to be the boiling point yeah boiling point now i just want to check with you dave yeah the part over here can you tell me what is going to be the state here gas gas plus oh, what? gas plus liquid okay gas plus liquid here they have completely changed into liquid and here will be liquid plus what solid, solid. yeah and then here they are completely solid yeah please take note of this now so that one is done okay so let's look at the effect of impurity okay generally pure compound okay they are measured by okay having uh, a fixed boiling point and melting point for example if you are talking about water okay the boiling point is going to be 100 degrees celsius melting point is going to be zero degree celsius this is pure compound of water yeah but okay if you have impurity for example salt and so on okay there is going to be uh effect towards your boiling point and melting point which can be actually shown over here but the graph yeah what we can show over here okay later we'll go into that melting point okay uh, do you know what will happen to the melting point dave if you have salt inside there, is it going? Yeah. Increase. Ah, uh, no, yeah. Please remember this. Yeah. Melting point will decrease. Okay. And then the boiling point will increase. Okay. Please remember this. Okay. So melting point will decrease. Boiling point will increase. Okay. So if I put it over here. Okay. What will happen generally? Okay, the graph will be slightly going up a bit. Okay, and the graph over here will be slightly going down. Okay, okay this is going to be for, okay, uh, and then it's not going to be even um, a straight line. Okay, they are going to be something like I show over here. So that is going to happen if you have impurity. Okay, if you have impurity. Okay, so they are going to, melting point will decrease, boiling point will increase please take note of that uh, of that now the next part okay that i taught you is going to be atoms okay or elements okay what are atoms atoms are smallest particle of matter okay that cannot be broken down yeah and what are elements okay elements can contain only one kind of atom and what are compounds okay compounds are atoms of different elements but they must be bonded together chemically okay and then we also have mixture okay we have already learned about mixture atoms of different elements together physically they are mixed physically but they are not chemically mixed example of mixture is going to be uh, sand water okay you can separate sand water physically okay example of methods of separation we already know you can use uh, decantation method okay you can use filtration generally you can separate mixture easily yeah but compounds, okay, you cannot separate them easily. Yeah, you, uh, they are bonded chemically. Okay, so from now, uh, from all these terms, I just want you to have a look over here. Okay, like I2, yeah, Dave, 
what do you think i2 is are they mixture compound element uh, yeah i2 are they mixture element. compound or element yeah the answer is element uh, why because they are same atom yeah they are uh, same atom it. how about co2 Uh, mm. uh, compound. compound okay because they are going to be um, different elements but they are together chemically yeah they are chemically together the same okay for water okay water is a compound okay it's a compound okay different element chemically mixed how about this uh, sulfur Dave as it element element yeah because they are the same okay atom yeah so please take note of this yeah so if uh the next part that we are going to look at normally when you write down the uh elements okay this is how we write down okay the bigger number at the top okay and then the low, uh, smaller number is six okay this is going to be your atomic number okay or your proton number and the one on top is going to be the mass number okay so we uh if let's say i want to find out okay pen proton electron and neutron so dave can you tell me what are the proton electron and neutron the number for carbon proton is six six uh, neutron is six and uh, electron is six okay so basically proton for neutral atom yeah so proton and electron are the same so six and six neutron okay we need to find the difference okay so 12 div, uh, minus six is going to be six okay so this one quite simple okay and then okay we also need to know about when we write the electronic configuration okay we write it in form of two okay the first shell can occupy two electrons followed by eight 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 and so on Okay, so if you look at this electron over here for carbon, okay, it's six. Okay, how do we write the electronic configuration for carbon over here, Dave? Two, four. Okay, two, four. Okay, two, four. That's it. Yeah. The first shell is going to be two, then followed by four. So total six. Yeah. So uh, we do have, okay, uh, another thing which is going to be known as ions. Okay, ions, okay, is going to be either... Okay, the uh, positive ions or negative ions. Okay, do remember, negative ions means because electron is negatively charged, negative ion means extra electron. Okay, electron from somewhere came in. Okay, positive ion means, okay, they have already lost the electron. Okay, it means you have less electron. Okay, they have less electron. So in this case, if you look at uh, Cl, okay, just Cl alone, yeah, before, uh, later we change. Proton is going to be 17. If neutral, uh, neutral chlorine is going to be same, 17. And then the neutron is the difference, okay, then it's going to be 18. Okay, this is for neutral Cl. Okay, but now because we see negative over here, and then I told you negative means extra electron extra how many electron extra one electron so what you need to do Wait, you so need do we put the one first or the minus first uh we do not need to put the one for minus so no, i mean uh mm. two if like minus yes two yes or like, yeah. you have two to put two first you have to put two first like for example o2 minus okay so the number comes well, first we, well, we get deducted if we write minus two instead of two minus for now okay uh I will suggest follow, yeah, but I don't, uh, maybe lower level, maybe we don't deduct, okay, but in higher level, okay, they will start deducting, yeah, just try to uh, uh, learn, yeah, so this one is 8 and 16, we'll look into that, okay, so this one, the number of electron now, because extra one electron, so from 17 will become 18, yeah, so here, okay, you see the same thing, okay, if you have, okay, uh, the normal, if it is going to be neutral, Okay, proton is 11, electron 11, and then this is 12. But now this is going to be ion because plus means they have lost one electron. So from 11, they become 10. 
yeah so if you look over here okay maybe uh you can try now okay uh so dave what is proton electron and neutron uh eight okay eight 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 Wait, okay no, oh, so eight, initially eight eight ten. eight and then now this one is going to be the electron because ten. two electrons so it's ten correct okay quite simple yeah so these are ions okay now how to actually uh, remember this okay if you look at the periodic table okay you have eight groups okay so uh, group one group two group three group four you ignore group five six seven and eight eight are noble gases you ignore that as well okay so do remember group one group two group three they are each going to be represented by valence electron what are valence electron outermost electron yeah so they have this electron so one electron at the uh, at the outermost shell okay two and three so generally group one group two group three they generally tend to lose electron to form when they lose electron they have positive one positive two positive three so all of them will follow that okay so when they gain electron you see group five they need to gain up to eight electrons so they will gain okay negative three three okay they will gain two electrons so become negative two they gain again one electron negative one and so on okay so do remember that yeah now the next part that i want to uh, go through is going to be the isotopes yeah for the isotopes okay isotopes generally they have the same number of protons okay but different number of neutrons example you can look at uh, cl chlorine Chlorine, okay, you can see same number of protons, 17, but the neutron is different. You can see if I find the uh, number of neutron over here, this is going to be 18 and then this is going to be 20. Okay, so the number of neutron are different. Yeah, so but if you look at the number of protons, 17 is the same. Electron is also 17. So the only thing is different is going to be neutron. Therefore, okay. Uh, this is uh, you can also calculate okay for isotope we need to learn how to calculate the relative atomic uh, mass okay uh, which is going to be normally they will provide us with the abundance yeah the percentage so how to do the calculation is quite simple okay we just need to uh, put the 75 percent they have given 75 percent you times it with 35 okay chlorine 35 yeah and then you plus with 25%, okay, you times with 37. And the answer, okay, you will get 35.5, yeah, so something like that. That is how we get the answer. Like the smaller mm. one, always times by 75%. No, 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 they will give you this value. This value will be given. So these are called abundance. It means in nature, there are 75% of this chlorine are chlorine 35 and 25% are going to be chlorine 37. So they will give you this value. So what you need to do is, whatever value that they give, okay, you put it into percentage 75 over 100, okay, and then you times with the 35, okay, whatever that you are calculating, yeah. And then you, whatever percentage you have, you times, then you add, yeah. So you cannot just simply add and divide by two. It doesn't work, yeah. So this calculation, please take note, okay? It is mentioned in the textbook also. But, okay, the next one that you need to know is the commenting on the chemical properties of isotope. Now, if you look, there are two isotopes over there, okay? If I want to comment about the chemical property, Dave, uh, is the chemical property going to be the same or different? Same. Yeah, it's still going to be the same because the number of electrons are still the same. Yeah, because the number of electrons are still 17. So the electronic configuration is 287, still group 7. Yeah, still group 7. So the way that they behave is going to be the same. So if they ask you to explain, they have the same number of electrons. For chemical reaction, you need the uh, you need to look at the electron but for physical property they are different density they are different and so on yeah but chemical property will be the same for isotope yeah don't get confused with ions yeah isotope now the next one is going to be a periodic table okay by now you should know when you go horizontally that's called period period is going to be showing us the number of shells 
and group is going to be the one that will go vertically it shows you the number of valence electrons example if you have magnesium okay 24 and 12 we always look at the number of electrons okay so you write down 282 so if you look at this okay number of shells one two three they are going to be at period number three and group number two because two valence electron okay so we need to know how okay to get this uh done yeah so let's actually try another one more example cl okay 17 and 35 okay try uh dave the electronic configuration for cl two uh two eight uh seven okay so period number Group number seven. Yeah, group number seven, seven valence electron. Okay, good. And Cl, okay, let's say now let's look at it also. Mg, if they form ion, they will form what kind of ion? They lose uh, electron or gain electron? Plus two. Yeah, lose electron, so they will become Mg2 plus. Okay, so how about Cl? Will they gain electron or lose electron? Uh, gain, so gain. Minus. yeah cl minus gain one electron to make it eight over here yeah so uh that is ion now the next part that we have learned is under group one okay group one alkali metals okay basically group one alkali metals they are soft silvery metal okay uh you can even cut it using your ruler okay so uh what you need to know about this group one alkali metals is the density going down yeah the density is going to increase melting point will decrease okay and then the reactivity when you go down okay is going to increase the reason is because okay they have one valence electron so when you have one valence electron okay and then i have uh, the number of shells increase so they are further away from the nucleus okay so when they go down, it's easier for them, okay, the one lower to escape out or to be lost because less attraction from the nucleus, okay. The nucleus is not going to hold the electron strongly, okay, because they are further away, yeah. So easier to go out, therefore the reactivity increases, okay. And you can look at the reactivity in terms of reaction with water, yeah. If I have lithium, okay, lithium, sodium, and potassium, they are... Uh, they are arranged in like uh, going down the group uh, group so lithium when you put on water they will float okay sodium they will form a silver ball and start shooting across the surface of the water but potassium they start to melt shoot across the water and then they will start to blame with lilac flame so it shows you that they are going to become more reactive with water and it is important to keep them okay in um in oil okay normally in uh, lab we keep it uh, keep them in oil so that they do not dis uh, they do not react with the uh, with the water vapor yeah in air yeah so that's why we try to keep them because they are very reactive so what generally happens when they react with water so any uh, group one metal they react with water they will give you this naoh or let's say for example okay lioh and then koh yeah, basically they are alkaline and the gas that will be released is hydrogen gas. So that's the reason why, okay, this one, if you use the litmus paper, okay, if you use the uh, red litmus paper, the red litmus paper is going to change into blue, yeah, because it's alkaline. Okay, so that's why they are called as group one alkali metals because when they react with water, okay, they will give you alkali solution, yeah. Mr. Well, we learned about group two, the alkaline, right? yes okay group two also but uh we uh for our syllabus we learn group one then straight away go to group uh seven yeah so no need to worry about that yeah but still alkaline yeah still alkaline okay now group seven okay they are go uh, known as halogens okay so when you arrange them okay going down the group okay it's f c b i but the last one is esterin yeah do remember okay all the halogens they can form diatomic that's why i put f2 cl2 br2 i2 yeah but esterin okay they are the only halogen that do not form diatomic they are going to be just exist as monoatomic yeah and another thing that you need to know is going to be the um, how they exist yeah so uh, fluorine gas okay uh, this is gas okay 
uh, at um, standard condition okay under 25 uh, room temperature okay chlorine exists as pale yellow green gas okay bromine exists as red brown liquid i2 exists as gray black solid but just now i told you iodine can sublime okay to give you purple gas yeah if you heat them up yeah they can sublime okay but you need to know that okay just now we also learned about okay when you go down density increase melting point decreases reactivity increases they have their own as well the boiling point will increase density also increase similar okay but uh, when it comes to reactivity okay reactivity decreases very much different compared to uh, group one yeah and then uh, we also learn under that okay displacement reaction okay since i told you okay the when they go down okay the group okay they become less reactive it means the one on top is more reactive so it means cl2 is more reactive than br2 more reactive than i2 yeah so uh the displacement reaction is basically they can uh, the halogens can displace its ions okay from the solution okay if they are more reactive yeah if they are more reactive so let's look at some example okay you see they are these are the couples okay these are the ions so we compare cl with br br and i i and uh, br but for this one we automatically know i and i there is no reaction okay because the same yeah no reaction okay let's look at cl and br cl is at the top of the br so there is a reaction okay there is a reaction therefore they will break the couple so kcl and then you have br2 okay how about this dave do you think there will be a reaction uh yeah yeah so br is at uh, the top um, I do KBR. Mm -mm. kbr and i2 good okay how about this i2 and br2 uh i2 and kbr um, this is less reactive than this so no uh, no reaction yeah okay i2 is lower okay than br br is more handsome for example yeah i already told you okay if they are more handsome there is no point of breaking the relationship yeah no reaction okay so the next part okay is going to be the transition metal this is a recent one that i taught you Okay, generally, okay, unlike group one, okay, group one, they have a soft metal. Okay, this one is going to be very hard and strong metal. Okay, high density, high melting point. Okay, they can conduct electricity and heat uh, nicely. Okay, but uh, when it comes to, uh, compared to group one, they are not that reactive. Yeah, and then the reactivity also, unlike like group one, okay, group one, going down, they become more reactive. Okay, uh, group seven, uh, group uh, seven okay going down they become less reactive okay but this one no cl uh, clear trend in reactivity okay but uh, we can see some special properties okay they can form colored compound okay examples i've given over there which is going to be if you have okay uh, like for example cu2 plus okay the color is going to be uh, blue if you have fe2 plus okay then the color is going to be green and if you have uh, fe3 plus the color is going to be brown yeah and then uh, the transition metals also yeah they can actually uh, act as a catalyst yeah so what is catalyst catalyst is going to be um, a substance okay that can uh, decrease the activation uh, energy okay to um, to make it okay, to make the reaction to follow a lower uh, alternative pathway with lower activation energy yeah so that the reaction can happen okay so examples okay like for example all these fe vanadium mn they are all catalysts from okay uh, transition elements yeah so this one are used for haber process production of ammonia these are going to be used for contact process production of sulfuric acid and this is used for decomposition of H2O2 uh, to give you oxygen gas. Okay, all this, okay, I told that we are going to have a project, okay, and you are going to find more information on that, yeah. And then the last one, uh, the second last one is going to be noble gases. Noble gases are going to be from group 8, okay. And these noble gases, they are unreactive 
and they are going to be monoatomic gases because why they are unreactive valence electron okay they have eight valence electron yeah so there is no need for them to lose electron there is no need for them to gain electron so therefore okay noble gases are unreactive okay they are monoatomic gases nothing much about noble gases over there and then uh, the last one that i want to touch over here okay which is going to be testing of gases okay so when you want to test for oxygen okay you are going to use glowing wooden spleen and the glowing wooden spleen is going to be rekindled yeah and then for hydrogen gas okay if you test with a lighted wooden spleen okay you can hear a pop sound yeah that is going to be how do we test hydrogen gas for carbon dioxide okay we uh, the lime water okay we can use lime water it turns lime water chalky yeah and then for ammonium, you will get a pungent gas and this pungent gas turns the red litmus paper to blue. And for Cl2, okay, Cl2, uh, if you use, generally we use, uh, supposed to use blue litmus paper because Cl2 is like acidic. It's supposed to change it into red, but uh, Cl2 have a special property, which is going to be, they are going to bleach. Yeah. So they are going to make the red litmus paper or blue litmus paper. It will become like colorless. Yeah. Uh, not to say colorless. They will remove the color of blue and they remove the color of um, red. So they will, uh, we say bleaches litmus paper. Yeah. So that is going to be the property of uh, Cl2. Okay. So these are the, so far what we have learned. Okay. From Okay, term one until now. Okay, and after this, we are still going to learn something further as well under chemical bonding. Okay, but I hope, okay, you guys, okay, uh, um, Dave is here, Gianna is here. Okay, I hope those who are going to watch this video also, okay, you get a clear idea, okay, about what we have learned until now. Yeah. Uh, do you have any questions, uh, Dave? It's already one hour exactly. Yes. Okay, if no question, Gianna, do you have any question, Gianna? No, sir. Yeah, so please go through this again. Yeah, if you have any further question or something, just uh, WhatsApp me, yeah. So anyway, okay, I will put this into YouTube. Yeah, you can actually watch it again, yeah. Uh, that's all from me, yeah. Thank you, guys. See you. Bye.